During E3 2015 and E3 2017, Microsoft made the incredible announcement that Xbox One was getting disc-based backwards compatibility with Xbox 360 games and original Xbox games. That was fantastic news, but at the same time this left PS4 fans wondering, hey Sony, where's our backwards compatibility? And that feature never came, and this video is going to explain why. <laughs> So before we get into the main reason of why Sony doesn't offer backwards compatibility in PS4, it's kind of better understood if we go over the two main ways that backwards compatibility is achieved in video game consoles. The first one would be emulation. Now emulation in a general sense means imitation. We'll use Xbox One as our example for this, and this basically means that Xbox One is pretending to be an Xbox 360 or an original Xbox in order to play their games. And you can see over time Microsoft has had good success with this, a lot of 360 games but it took a lot of time to get those out, and only a handful of Xbox titles are available. The other method is called System on a Chip. We'll use PS3 as our example for this one, or more specifically, launch PlayStation 3. So that would be the 20 and 60 gigabyte models. These are the ones that could play PS2 games. System on a chip basically means that instead of PS3 pretending to be a PS2, a PS2 is just inside of a PS3, granting immediate hardware level access to all those games. For the most part, pretty much every PS2 game would be available. Maybe one or two might have a problem or there may be a compatibility issue. There, those certainly crop up, but for the most part, it's immediate access to the entire PS2 catalog. Now, between both of these methods, there's actually a number of pros and cons. And for emulation, one of the pros is that the games can actually be manipulated to the point where you're getting better performance out of them. This is how Microsoft achieves better looking 360 and Xbox games. They're getting higher frame rates, higher resolutions, and a wider range of colors. The biggest con of emulation is that it's not simple. In fact, it is extremely complex at times. It takes a lot of time, money, resources, a lot of manpower, and you get a gradual amount of releases. That's why there was only 100 Xbox 360 games available when it launched and there's only a handful of original Xbox games. Meanwhile, on System on a Chip, this is a direct pro. It's hardware level support, so you're getting almost immediate compatibility like we had just mentioned, but the biggest con to System on a Chip is price. It costs a lot of money to put that hardware back in a new hardware, and ultimately this price is passed on to the consumer. That's why the original PlayStation 3 was very expensive at $500 and $600 respectively, and this is ultimately what led to PS2 backwards compatibility being removed from the PlayStation 3 over time as Sony was struggling to sell PS3s, they removed the feature to lower the price of the system. With all that in mind, it's time to go over Microsoft's side of the story, and it may surprise you, but actually, backwards compatibility was meant to be in the Xbox One at launch in 2013, but they missed it. In fact, the Microsoft team was working on this as early as 2007. Yeah, before Xbox One even existed. Microsoft was planning this the entire time. They were working on an Xbox 360 emulator that early. They worked on it for a few years, ran into a few problems, but they ended up having to halt the project for a little bit as Xbox One launched, and they were dealing with remodeling the system a little bit, taking out the DRM policies and all that nonsense. And ultimately, once Xbox head Phil Spencer was appointed in early 2014, Phil Spencer recouped that team back up, and they got back to work on backwards compatibility. And one of the first games that they actually used was Castle Crashers, a very simple Xbox Live game, had Xbox Live features, networks, network features, things like that. They wanted to use that game to test it out a little bit, and they actually ran into a number of issues. The game crashed constantly, and they just couldn't seem to get over whatever it was that they were trying to figure out. They actually had to contact the developer to receive help in getting the game actually work. And once they had that working, they had the emulator kind of at a base level where they could test a lot more games. They still ran into a few issues with a number of other titles. There were certain situations where games would run at a single frame per second. So it was a very trial and error thing that they had to figure out. One of the biggest problems was the audio codec and just how the Xbox 360 was running compared to the 64-bit that Xbox One was running at. But ultimately over time they got it to work on most titles and that's how they were able to achieve the 104 launch titles that they originally promised at the end of 2015 when they announced it in June 2015 during E3. And this was the same story with original Xbox backwards compatibility. They started doing that around 2016. They had a small team working on it and uh, they initially had a success rate of 10% on Xbox titles, so 10% of games were really working and were being playable, but over time they got that up to 90% and ultimately they were able to bring that as well. Of course, Xbox games are a bit tougher because of their age, so they're so old to the point where the licensing kind of comes, that becomes a bit of an issue because a lot of those publishers don't even exist anymore. A lot of deals uh, were written on paper. I mean, it's very tough to kind of solidify those agreements to have the games being sort of re-released on Xbox One today, 
but still it is achievable and that's why a handful of xbox original xbox games are also available for microsoft's situation it's easy to understand why they went the route they went Xbox 360 wasn't, it was a unique architecture, sure, but it wasn't vastly different from PC in a manner where it couldn't be uh, figured out in terms of emulation. And more importantly, Microsoft also knew they were going to be bundling a Kinect camera with every single Xbox One back in 2013. So they pretty much knew right away that they didn't want to do system on a chip because it would have made the system too costly. Granted, it would have made it easier, but the company also said they did not want parity. When you do system on a chip, yeah, you get immediate access and availability to all those games on a hardware level, but it's a bit tougher to influence those games in a way where you can uh, upscale them or manipulate them much like you can with, uh, with software emulation. So this is a long-term situation where Microsoft knew immediately, as early as 2007, they were going to do emulation and they avoided system on a chip. And now we move on to Sony and their reason and the two methods of backwards compatibility. Now it's easy to see why they didn't do system on a chip. They just got out of a generation where they launched at five to six hundred dollars with system on a chip and then having to remove it to get the cost of manufacturing down and to lower the price of the PS3. Now at the time, Sony was losing money on every PS3 sold at five to six hundred dollars. So you can't lower the price even more because you'd be losing even more money. They had to figure out ways to get cost of manufacturing down to ultimately lower the price of that system. They definitely weren't going to do that this time around. They're in a completely different mindset with PS4, going from cell processor to x86, focusing on developers, and ultimately they wanted to release at $400, they wanted to undercut Microsoft, they wanted to make an affordable console, and system on a chip was just not the way to go. Which brings us to software emulation. Why didn't Sony do software emulation on PS4 when Microsoft spent years of time, money, effort, and resources into making it work on Xbox One? Well, the unfortunate reality is just the nature of PlayStation 3. Sony shot themselves in the foot by using cell processor in PlayStation 3. The PS3's architecture was overly difficult to make games for, and developers spent a long time trying to master the PS3's cell processor. This is why a lot of Xbox 360 games ran better than the PS3 versions, even though PS3 technically on paper was a more powerful platform. So at this point, it's somewhat understandable to see why Sony didn't do emulation either on PS4, probably because it may not even be possible just due to the nature of how PS3 games were made and how much available horsepower the PS4 has. If it took Microsoft that long and they ran into that many issues to get 360 games emulated on Xbox One, it's very probable that Sony may not even be in a position where they can make it work at all. And just for perspective's sake, there actually is a PS3 emulator for PC and Linux that you could go out and download. It works quite well. I mean, it's hit or miss. It's a title by title basis. Some games work great. Some games don't work at all. And some are hit and miss with frame rate and performance, but there is an emulator out there. And the site's recommended performance is quite high, or at the very least, it's much higher than a PlayStation 4 which at this point is 2013 technology. And, and even back then, that was still considered a very affordable box because it was $400, so it wasn't certainly top tier PC technology. So given all the circumstances of where we're at, it is very likely it just may not work. And let's say it does work. Let's say if Sony had enough engineers on it, if they really took the time, if they put the brightest brains in the world on it, maybe they could get it to work. But it would be one of those things at that point where for the amount of effort it would take, it just wouldn't really do Sony much of any good, especially given the fact that they're currently the market leaders with console sales. Which brings us to our final point, which is that it's a conflict of interest, the big elephant in the room, PlayStation Now. When you look at it, both these companies had already figured something out years in advance. For Microsoft in 2007, they knew they were going to do emulation. For Sony, they knew they were going to be purchasing Gaikai technology for streaming, and they knew they were going to be pursuing PlayStation Now, which ultimately led to the streaming of PlayStation 3 titles. And that's essentially it. There really was no reasonable option for Sony to go about doing it. They wanted to release an affordable console. And even at one point, Sony's worldwide studio, Shuhei Yoshida, even said emulation is hard, which is probably him somewhat saying that it's just not really in our interest to try it because it probably isn't going to work anyway. And Sony decided on streaming games anyway, much like Microsoft decided on emulation just years in advance. But the good news is, PS4 and Xbox One are both based on x86 architecture. That's why X1X and PS4 Pro, there's full game compatibility there. And it's very likely that the next generation, currently based on rumors, PS5 and the Xbox Scarlet will also be x86, which means those machines will more than likely be backwards compatible. The only difference being that PlayStation 5 will only play PS4 games, and then PlayStation Now 
whereas Xbox Scarlet will play Xbox One, 360, and original Xbox games, which would be quite impressive if Microsoft can actually get that down. So that's all I've got for you in this video. I hope you have a better understanding of the situation at hand. And if you haven't already, subscribe for more PlayStation stuff, video game coverage, video game discussion, explanations, reviews, tutorials, all that good stuff. That's it for me in this video, and I'll see you all in the next one. Take it easy.